Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Twin City Bible Church. My name is Katie Martin. I'm going to be your MC today, and I am so glad that you are here. I was just looking at all of those questions popping up, and I definitely need to brush up on my Bible trivia. That's one thing. And I was also just scrolling through to see all of your videos. I saw some shenanigans going on over there at the Jones house. I saw some quiet reading. I love that everybody is just coming as they are. I wanna remind you, you can also turn on your videos. We want you to turn on your videos. Say hello in the chat box as we all come together this morning. The first thing that we get to do this morning together is our call to worship. And that comes today from Psalm 27 plus four through six. If you are able, please stand with me and let's read together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter in that day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Now let's head over to Trevor and Kayla for some worship music. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be together with you. And we are coming to you from the west side of Champaign. Um, join us with the whole hearts and, and sing to the Lord. We're going to be thinking about uh, God's sovereignty and his rulership over things this morning so let's uh, let's bring that up to him
Jesus shall reign where the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and shall endless prayer be made and endless praises crown his head his name like sweet perfume shall rise with every now she's going to walk us through the next several things. Thank you Trevor and Kayla and welcome again everybody to TCBC again. My name is Katie Martin. I'm coming to you from Urbana this morning. I know we are all spread out in Champaign-Urbana and also around the world. It is just so great to have you all with us this morning. I want to give you a quick reminder we will be having communion later on in our service. So if you haven't gotten your communion elements ready, go ahead and get those ready. You may not have grape juice, you may not have bread, but anything that you have on hand is okay uh, for communion. So get that ready as we go through some announcements this morning. I also see most of you have your videos on, keep those videos on, say hello to everyone in the chat box um, as you are able. Hi, I see some people waving at me. <laughs> um, that is so great. I love seeing all of your faces. Here at TCBC, our mission is to see campus and community transformed by Christ to renew the world. I know some of you are students, you are figuring out how to do classes and research and papers. Um, some of you are teachers, you are faculty members, you are teachers in the community and you're figuring out how can I give my best and serve my students. Some of you, our parents and grandparents and you're figuring out how to do life differently at home. I know I have two young kids at home, so we're doing virtual school. There's lots of things that are different about our lives today. But the great thing is in those times where we are stretched, that is also a time where God can move powerfully in our lives individually, in our families, in our community, and we truly can be transformed by Christ and impact the world around us. That is what we are about as a church. 
Um, and I'm so glad that you are connecting with us this morning. If it is your first time joining us, or if it's not your first time too, I want you to go ahead and go online to our online connection card. You see it here on the screen, tcbc.cc slash online card. We would love for you to let us know some of your contact information. And also if you need anything from us, there's places for you to put that on there as well. There's a couple other ways that we can connect as well. Connecting is so important. One of those ways is our TCBC family room. That is our Facebook group online. I know I've posted stuff on there, questions, comments. It's just a great way to interact with friends from TCBC and to see if there's any needs out there or questions out there that you can contribute to, that you can connect to, um, or vice versa. Maybe someone is willing to connect to you and help you out as well. So go there. That's a great place to get information as well. I know our um, lunches uh, shifted times, and that's where I found out some information about that earlier this week or last week. Other place that we can connect is just on our website. We have had some changes um, for COVID restrictions coming up. If you're curious about anything, Related to that, we have an announcement today, but there's also more information on our website. You can sign up for our newsletter, tcbc.cc slash email. It's that little link in the middle of the screen that you see there. I know I got lots of extra announcements and extra time to go over this morning. So sign up for that, check that out, check your um, inbox for that. And finally, another way to connect is through our prayer wall. If there's something on your heart, we would love to be praying for you. And there's prayer requests posted from other people too, where we can really be lifting each other up in prayer in a special way. So check that out. It is tcbc.cc slash. And you can also put anonymous prayer requests, uh, whatever you're comfortable, but that is a great way to connect um, as a community and as a family who loves one another and wants to pray for each other. Now we're going to head to Pastor Brian. He's got a special announcement for us. Good morning, everybody. The sun has shifted and I'm uh, glowing here a bit, but it's great to see all of you. Um, as maybe you've heard in our region here, region uh, six here in central Illinois, tomorrow we're going to be under some new tighter restrictions, a tier one mitigation uh, because of the way COVID is uh, resurging here in our region. Um, and so that's gonna have some very immediate effects on our in-person services. As you know, we've had the blessing of have, having um, in-person service, services of up to 50 the last three weeks. We were scheduled to do this today. We were hoping to have two the next two weeks, but the new mitigation um, phase is going to be at least 14 days. And part of what it says is, you know, there's no indoor restaurants and, and bars and things, but also gatherings of 25 or less, 25 is the limit. And just what it takes to put on a service on a practical level, you know, if you have 10 folks who are putting on the service for 15, it, you know, it, at that point it becomes uh, well, let's just wait and see how this uh, this window of time goes and, and we can re regroup. But we want to remain flexible and we also are committed to ministering uh, and, and connecting with all of you. And so we're going to have some opportunities, creative ways to engage. One of those is, as you, it's hard to believe it's November, but it's going to be soon Advent season and we're going to be doing an Advent candle pickup. If you would like to receive uh, Advent candles, we are doing a suggested donation, but you can order them. And we'll be having an opportunity as a church community to celebrate Advent together, even in socially distanced time, distant times, um, pandemic or you know mitigation or not, whatever's happening in Advent. Obviously, if we have the opportunity, we'll do things in person, uh, but nevertheless, we will respond in grace and in acknowledgement that Jesus is on the throne and God is leading us through this time and uh, we want to continue to connect with one another. Um, given all of that, I want to lead a time of prayer. It is a stressful season. We have pandemic, we have new restrictions now, we have election season, we have just the, um, the attrition of life as it's been the last 
seven or eight months and all the things that have happened. So let's come to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to start us off. Katie Martin, our MC, is going to finish. And I'm going to pray over us and over our CU community as we see infection rate increasing. Uh, and Katie's going to spend some time also just with the, the election coming up, or at least election night, I should say, in a couple of days to pray for our nation, to pray for our elected officials, and to lead us in a prayer, um, the Lord's Prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just, just take a moment and quiet our souls. Lord, our hope is in you. And, and Father, I pray in this season where um, we see cases of COVID rising and uh, many of us feel constrained because we can't see family and grandparents, can't see grandkids and et cetera, Lord, we recognize the losses. Um, we recognize the mourning that we go through, the frustration, even the depression, Lord, that many of us are facing. I pray, Lord, that you would be the lifter of our heads in this moment in time, that our hope would not be in our circumstances, but in fact, that you would move our hearts towards more worship, knowing that you are a present help in a time of trouble. Lord, we need your help. And we pray for our community. We not only pray for our church community, Lord, that we would sense your presence in these difficult times in stressful times. But Lord, we pray for our community, Lord. Your call is to love our neighbor as ourself. We pray for those that are isolated, God, that you would encourage them. We pray for uh, teachers and for uh, healthcare workers and others that are putting themselves out there in stressful situations, that you would give them grace. We pray for our um, uh, just our region, Lord, that you would bring grace as we see this virus spreading and that this mitigation effort would be effective to reverse uh, the trend. And we thank you that you are in control. Lord, we release our desire to be in control and give it over to you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for all this in your name. Father, we thank you that you love us, that you know our prayers, you know what's on our hearts before we even ask. We thank you that you are so big, that you are in control of everything. We thank you for our church. We thank you for everyone with us this morning, that we are together, though apart, we are together um, to worship you. We thank you especially for our missionary of the week, for Troy Rendelman, who works with Crew, We thank you for all that he has been doing and been able to do despite COVID, that he's been able to pour himself into the lives of so many students. We thank you that the fall retreat had over 80 students come. God, we thank you for the seeds that were planted, for the relationships that were started that will grow into something beautiful that will transform lives. We thank you that the students were hungry. We thank you that we are hungry, God, and that we know that you can only satisfy. We pray for the students that Troy is interacting with that you would not only give them hunger, but give them the knowledge that you and you alone are what they need. We also come to you, Father, thankful for your word, thankful for your scriptures that guide us. In, second, in 1 Timothy 2, you teach us that prayers, petitions, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So as we are in the midst of a contentious election season here in the United States, in obedience to scripture's teaching, we come and we offer up our prayers for our government, for our elected officials, and the upcoming election. Our Heavenly Father, you sent your Son into the world not to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved and that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. Father, we pray for our government. We pray for all nations and people of the earth, for those in authority among them, for our federal, our state, our local government officials in the United States. We lift up President Donald Trump. We lift up Vice President Mike Pence. We lift up Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Governor J.B. Pritzker. We pray for our Congress, our state legislature, our county and city government officials, for all of our Supreme Court justices, judges, and officers of our courts, for all of these elected officials and leaders in our nation and around the world, for the members and representatives of the United Nations. By your help, O oh God, may they seek wisdom and justice and your truth and act in the ways of peace. Let us pray in silence for a few moments, continuing to lift up our government and elected leaders. Almighty God, we pray that in every heart, every heart, that you would kindle the true love of peace and justice. Guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your kingdom may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, we continue to pray for this election season, for the candidates who are seeking election, for their campaigns, for the members of the media who are giving us information, for those who are overseeing and administering the election, for all of us who are exercising our right to vote, and for those whom we disagree with politically. God, we pray that your wisdom your justice, your truth, your peace, your love might prevail over all in this contentious season. Let us pray in silence again for a few moments, continuing to lift up the election that will come to a close on Tuesday. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. In this season, would you allow each of your people to rely on your strength and to accept their responsibilities, whether as citizens to elect trustworthy leaders or as government officials to make the decisions for the well being of our society? Father, may we serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. We remember that we are your people. We are citizens of heaven where our Lord Jesus Christ lives and reigns. Jesus, our savior, we eagerly await for your return. Now let us pray together out loud the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. You'll see it on the screen. Our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For your is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Father, as we transition now to hear your word, to hear the message, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, soften our spirits to receive the word that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to hear a scripture reading. The word of the Lord from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm, Thus in the Lord, my beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Well, it's great to see you all this morning. Um, happy first day of November. We had the uh, blue moon last night. I think it was the second moon of October or something. Um, but I'm excited to get into our word uh, this morning. I just wanted to give you all a heads up. I was able to be a part of a conversation in talking about as Christians, uh, how we engage politics, how we uh, deal with the challenges and, and stress and anxiety of this political time uh, was recorded in, in a conversation with Darlene Kleppel, who is a part of our church and is also the county executive. So she's a local official uh, with Scott Outhouse, who's a professor and um, works in the uh, social sciences and, um, and, and policy and, and whatnot in terms of from an academic standpoint. Um, and Scott Beatty, who is a local radio and, and also engaged in um, covering games and whatnot, but has to cover uh, lots of issues um, locally. And then the director was sort of a, a host. So we got to talk, and that, that video is gonna be released on um, our TCBC family room, which if you're not a part of that, I encourage you to sign up on that. You can look online, I think, to get more details. And it's also gonna be in our, um, YouTube. So, so that's that. Um, but we are going to turn our attention to the Word of God. I encourage you to open your Bibles and uh, mute your screens. And uh, let's go to the Lord and worship. I'm going to pray as I transition into the message. Father, thank you for your grace. Lord, help us be hearers of your Word and doers of your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So as we, uh, you know, very aware of the season. Um, this particular scripture passage talks about our citizenship in heaven. It is appropriate that we address on some levels how we engage in this political uh, season and the other anxieties that we're facing. The, the title of this message is Citizens of Heaven. We're continuing our Rooted series of what it means to be rooted in Christ despite all the challenges that we face um, and it, as we think about, well, what does it mean to be citizens? Paul has three important things to say here, uh, that we would imitate Christ followers, not just Jesus himself and not just the word Christ followers, that we would await the King, our true King, that we would hope in true renewal. So imitate Christ followers, await the King in true renewal. Let's look at the first point, imitate Christ followers. Paul says in verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul has this imitation theology, and I don't mean like when you're baking, you have imitation vanilla and then the real extract. Imitation in that part of what means to follow Jesus is to have real flesh and blood people that we would imitate in understanding how to do that. Um, a few weeks 
celebrated as a family. Uh, our oldest child, Josiah, his birthday, and we made New York style pizza. Started making pizza years ago. And if you're familiar with making pizza, if you've ever made it on your own, or perhaps you've not made it, I could give you the recipe. And you could measure out the flour and know when to add the oil and how long to knead the dough. But when it comes to actually working the dough after it has done its proof and getting it ready as a pizza and roll, you know, push, kneading it out and all that stuff. By the way, I don't do that. My wife does that. Um, I could not tell you the directions or the, the directions, written directions wouldn't help you. You actually need to see somebody do it to, to fully get how that works. Um, I remember as a fifth grader, trying to do an assignment where the assignment was can, is to get up in front of the class and explain how you do something. You know, well, in some instances, writing instructions, written instructions are helpful. In other instances, it's actually too challenging to write it out. So I, I, uh, I picked my assignment. I'm supposed to get up in the class and explain uh, how this works. I thought, okay, I want to, I want to explain basketball, the game of basketball. I love basketball. Um, at the time, you know, college basketball. And so as I tried to do that assignment, I quickly realized that is way too complicated to write out that I could explain that. And so I picked how to make a cup of coffee. Much more easy to lay that out. Why is it that written instructions are helpful in some cases, but in other cases of physical demonstration is better. The game of basketball, I played basketball, I, I went to clinics and I played on a high school basketball team and learned how to be a better basketball player by watching other basketball players, not by reading about basketball. Why is it that certain instructions are helpful or certain, certain cases instructions are helpful that are written, but in others it's a physical demonstration that we need. It is because for certain tasks and procedures, it's easier to follow written directions, you know, just a simple task, a recipe, uh, uh, directions. How do you get from point A to B? But for a lifestyle or for something that's a complicated action, you know, like if I would say a dance routine, it's easier to learn it by watching someone else. So how do we learn how to be a Christian? The gospel, of course, is central to us learning, not only learning, but even becoming a Christian. Um, and so the gospel, which by the way, is not about us, but is about what Jesus did for us. The gospel message does require words. There's no way to demonstrate the gospel because the, the gospel is not something that humans did. The gospel is something God did for us. The gospel requires that we hear or read uh, or have someone preach to us uh, what it is and what it means for us. We can't learn the gospel by looking at botany or studying the stars. We can learn lots of other attributes about God, but to learn about his free offering of grace and the redemption that comes through Jesus, we have to have access to a written or verbal communication. But in terms of how do we respond to the gospel? Yes, we need the Bible and we that is our ultimate source, the standard, the norm for all norms. But we also need other people. We need other believers. We need those that are following Christ to be imitators of. I think about how I learned how to pray. I've read a lot of books about prayer. But how did I really learn how to pray? I've, I've learned to pray with other people. I think about my family, in fact, as, as a family, we try to do family worship in, at night, getting ready for bed and doing reading the Bible and praying. And it's so, uh, it's so funny to watch, but also just uh, heartwarming how our kids have developed in their prayers, how our older two kids, Josiah is 12 and Abby who's nine and thinking about how Maddie who's five and Sally who's two. And so there's a lot that they learn from each other. They learn from us, they learn from each other. Uh, and, and Maddie, you know, she'll be praying and, and thanking God for the day and pray, Lord, help us to not fight, help us to have a good attitude, help us to obey. Solomon, he's two years old, help us have a good day, help us to not fight. Those are their, those are their prayers, why? Because they're imitating each other. And as Christians, we learn 
how to do things by imitating one another. As I've gotten to know folks here in the church and showing up on prayer meetings on, on Wednesday night via Zoom and praying with some of our LC members and praying with our shepherding team, praying with our staff, I pick up ways that folks, you know, Lynn, who's the chair of our um, LC team, how she prays, or Neilan, the chair of our shepherding team, and how he prays, and our other shepherds, and our other LC members, and our staff. And, and so as Christians, we learn by imitating. We learn by seeing real examples. And Paul calls us to follow his example, the example of others that are following Jesus Christ. Our discipleship as Christians is both didactic, in other words, we learn by teaching what I'm doing right now, but we also learn by seeing other people. In fact, my ministry as a pastor is a call to do both. In 1 Timothy 4, 11 and 12 in verse 16, Paul tells Timothy, so Paul is talking to Timothy who is referenced in this letter that we're reading in Philippians. Timothy, who was his son in the Lord, Timothy, who was now pastor in, in 1 Timothy over the church in Ephesus. Paul tells Timothy, he says, command and teach these things. Let no one despise your, you, your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, yourself and the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is a pastor. Timothy was a pastor of a church. And Paul is saying to him, you need to be thinking about what I've taught you and teach those things, but you also need to be thinking about how you live and your life needs to be an example for other believers because we learn how to be a Christian by imitating other Christians, as well as by learning doctrine and theology and all the things that we derive from scripture. Why is it so important that we imitate those who follow Christ. What's at stake? Paul goes on to say in verse 18, back in Philippians, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ. What a powerful statement and phrase. What does it mean to be an enemy of the cross? And what is so, so delineating about that that term or that reality. The cross is the most humbling reality in all of human existence, all of human history. The cross of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross, it is humbling because as we know, everyone acknowledges something is wrong with the world. And in the political season, people have very sharp distinctions about what is wrong and who's at fault. But the gospel tells us actually What's wrong with the world is not those other people over there in their ideology and their practices. What's wrong with the world is all of us, our sinfulness. And the message of the cross is so humbling because it says our situation is much worse than we would like to acknowledge. It required the son of God to die to even make things right. And in doing so, only for those who fully believe in him, who believe in him, who trust in him, who turn to him and put their hope in him. The cross is a humbling message. And for those who are enemies of the cross, they are lessening the idea of what it means to be a sinner and saying it really isn't that bad. Or perhaps they're saying that there is some other way we could justify ourselves. Or perhaps they're saying, I'm just going to go full fledged into what I desire and what I want. But whatever the case may be, and scholars aren't fully sure which of those groups Paul is referencing here, they were enemies of the cross. And Paul saying the, the word that sort of starts that um, verse for many is a word of causal um, a, a conjunction. It's basically saying, why should you? imitate those who, like myself, follow Jesus and others who follow Jesus, because there's other people who are following a different path. And if you're not intentional about whom you follow, you will be following and imitating 
someone. Paul is contra contrasting how he walks as a follower of Christ and those who walk as enemies of the cross. And he draws a line and he says, you should imitate those who follow Jesus. He further talks about what these individuals, men and women, who are enemies of the cross are like in verse 19, he gives characteristics um, that their end is, is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Their mindset is earthly and really three characteristics. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame. Earlier in the same chapter, Paul gives three characteristics of what it means to be um, true believers, true followers of the faith. We are the circumcision, circumcision who worship by the spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, put no confidence in the flesh. These are very different descriptions and characteristics of those who minds are set on earthly things. They are enemies of the cross, um, which can mean that their desires, their ideas, their opinions become their ultimate guide. In other words, it is a picture of idolatry. They glory in their shame. Glory was a term in the Old Testament that was synonymous with God himself because God is ultimate glory and he is glorious. And the fact that they glory in their shame, the shame would be the shame of idols, the shame of idolatry. And that idolatry could cover lots of different maladies. They are glorying in their own idolatry, in their own will, their own ideas, their own mindset. John Frame, who is an apologist, a Christian apologist, he says that unbelief in scripture really falls into two categories, atheism and idolatry. In other words, either clearly I just say there's no God, or clearly I give my heart to some other God besides the Lord. And when he talks about this, these two options of unbelief, two categories of unbelief, atheism and idolatry, he talks about idolatry is not always being rational. And what he means by that is not that people who are idolatrous don't think, but what he is saying is the way by which we end up following idols is not always led by our, our rational thinking. In fact, our affections can lead us astray. Oftentimes our heart chooses things before our mind even catches up and our mind, as I've heard it said before, justifies the things that our heart has chosen. What are some of the ways that we develop idolatry? Well, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a year where there's been cries for social, uh, racial justice, in the midst of the election season, man, there's a lot of ways to have idolatry. We could have idolatry around just stop, look, just put a stop to all of it, um, that we really want comfort, that that is the idol, the thing that we seek. Or we could be uh, uh, putting our hopes, our ultimate hope in Somebody just needs to fix this. We just need to get the right leaders and the right people and the right plan just to fix all of it. That's our ultimate hope. By the way, an idol is when we take a good thing and we make it ultimate or maybe not a good thing, but that it becomes our ultimate aspiration, the thing that dictates everything else. Perhaps in an election season, we put our hope in our government in one way or another, that we would hope that the United States would be the fullness of the kingdom of God and that the two would have a one-to-one -one relationship. Perhaps our hope and our idolatry and the anxiety of the election would be about your candidate of choice. You think it's this person or it's that person that's gonna make all the difference. And if we could just get enough people lined up to make that happen. No matter how we formulate our idolatries, the reality is, is all of them ground us into what is earthly thinking. 
beyond how we feel about the pandemic and feel about the election, uh, there's plenty of people to imitate. In fact, in our idolatry of the heart, which John Calvin says that the heart is an idol factory, um, as we make steps towards one direction, there are plenty of people who will help us further that journey of idolizing one entity or another one person or another one political party or another one candidate or another one reality or another. What is your hope in the midst of all of this? Either we are in Im intentionally imitating those whose hope is in Jesus Christ, or we are being influenced, whether we recognize it or not, by uh, earthly things. I, I, I brought up a few weeks ago social media, and part of what happens in social media is that we are not the customer when we are logging on and we are scrolling and looking at stories and whatnot. We are actually the product that's being sold to advertisers. And it's that subtle change that is going on in our hearts that truly is the product of what is being sold. We have lots of encouragement along the way in that process. Not that all social media is bad, but certainly if we go down certain roads, there's a lot of help to create idols. Where is our hope? Our hope, our hope is in our true king. As we await the king, this point to, uh, Paul says in verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. That term, um, it obviously references on one level for what would be familiar for Philippians, that they were well, at least some of them, citizens of Rome. Now, Rome, you could be a resident, but not a citizen. Um, that's a little more complicated. But my point is that they would have that understanding that that is the realm in which citizenship is most often talked about. In fact, Paul himself was a Roman citizen. And so for him to say, we, our citizenship is in heaven, is to put a very different spin on what citizenship means. And in fact, it puts the whole aspect of the gospel and the kingdom of God in a very different place than the political realm and other social issues and concerns. Um, Roman citizenship was a big deal. At one point, Paul, as you read through Acts, he appealed to the fact that he was a Roman citizen and should be treated as such. Part of the universal religion of the Roman Empire was to worship the emperor. And so that you would have peoples from different um, subgroups and they had their own communal gods that they would worship. But one of the ways that the Roman Empire was successful, at least in the eyes of the Roman Empire, was by having everybody worship the same God. And part of that was to worship the emperor himself. Paul uses this language that we are citizens of, of heaven and we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Those two words, Lord and savior, were actually used of the emperors. The emperor was called the Lord and the savior. That started in the years leading up to the birth of Christ and had continued and certainly was present in this particular time. And so for Paul to be saying that our citizenship is in heaven that our Lord, our Savior is Jesus Christ would not uh, fall, fall flat to the ground on his hearers. They would recognize exactly what he means. He means that our citizenship is not of an earthly dwelling. And in fact, our greatest allegiance is not to the king, but is to the king of kings, Jesus Christ. And certainly in our United States of America, we have the same temptation to make our citizenship here. I, and I, by the way, I recognize many of you are not American citizens and it's, this is not in any way to create a distinction, but just in the light of what is happening, um, this is how I'm uh, uh, approaching the text. Um, but certainly we have um, the temptation to make our citizenship in whatever country we're from to be our primary identity. But Paul's saying, no, your citizenship is of a different order, a higher order of the kingdom of God. 
And we also have the same temptation to make emperor worship part of our sort of pantheon of gods with the lowercase g here in the United States to make worship of the president and other leaders who are political to be the thing that we put our hope in. Paul says, no, we await a different king, a different savior, a different Lord. The one in his pedigree is the cross because ultimately our king truly understands what's wrong with our world and only our king had the power to do something about it. We await our king. We await our king. The Lord wants to make sure that we are not being formed in this season of election by our hope for one party or another, one figure or another. Uh, it's interesting when we think about social media and how it can impact us. The way it is all set up is that there are big computers that they keep track of every single move that we make online, everything that we scroll through, everything that we pause on, everything that we click on, and it clicks and, and, and it keeps in track of all of this. And these computers, they're programmed to, to um, they're trying to predict how we will respond if we are fed certain information. And so what it does is it gets better and better the longer we spend on it. And what ends up happening is if we click on things that, for example, are political, we get further and further into that whole realm and such that on social media, we can end up in an echo chamber. And we see the world through that lens and we wonder how could anybody else see or think differently. And it, we don't, it's because we're in this realm and there's others that are in different realms and all of us have a different feed we're not all looking at the same things because of the way it's set up the lord wants us to be sure that our hope is not in whatever is being presented to us in these various forums it's not in what is happening on tuesday or subsequently afterwards all after whenever the votes are counted our hope is in him we serve a king that we did not elect he elected us. We serve a king that we did not put in charge of our country, but he brought us into his kingdom. We serve a king whom we did not choose, but he chose us. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and it is him that we await his second coming. Our third point here, here is hope in true renewal. Hope and true renewal. That's point three. Verse 21 says, Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious, glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself? The object of our hope is our heavenly citizenship in Christ Jesus. And Jesus has the power. He's coming back and he is actually going to bring a full renewal. When we look at the story of redemption in, in the scripture, sin has affected all of society, all of creation, not just the spiritual world, but the physical world. And we think about politics, it's very much politics, by the way, and, and the government is honestly a part of God's plan but not in the way that we most often think about it if we are engaged in a heavily intensified identification with one party versus another. Part, God's redemption plan includes everything physical, everything spiritual and everything else. Because as it says, when he comes back, we will be transformed. Our lowly body will be like his glorious body. Uh, philosophers in the Greek, ancient Greek world would have a dualism. They would have said, heaven, good, earth, evil. Therefore, we should be about what's good and not, what about, not about what is evil. But the gospel is different. The gospel doesn't say heaven, good, earth, evil. The gospel says, and scripture says, when God created the heavens and the earth, all of it was good. And as a as a result, God's plan to redeem is both spiritual and physical. Not only will our souls be saved, but we also 
will receive a glorious physical body like that of our Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. So our hope is in true renewal. You know, as we think about political options or the ways that there is a narrative that the two main political parties they give us, one party would say, um, you know, on the, the, the right is, is to look backwards and say the good time was in the past and our effort should be to make things like they used to be and to get it back to what it used to be. On the left, it's the narrative is, well, we are going forward to a, a utopian hope in the future and we should put our, our work in towards making the future better, two divergent narratives. And it's easy as Christians to sort of get on board with one narrative or the other and wonder, well, how could anybody think that that other option is good? What's interesting when you think about that is that both narratives are actually in some ways borrowed from Christianity. And, and there's a lot of resonance in both narratives from what it, the scripture talks about. On the one hand, we look at the past of human existence and it was good. What God created, what God had with his people in the garden was good. And part of redemption is re-undoing what was, what was done there. And we, as we, as, but it's also true that as we look forward into the future, that where we are headed is a better reality. It's not a human-oriented utopia, but it's God renewing the heavens and the earth. And so both of these narratives are uh, resonant with Christianity, but both of those narratives are also dissonant with Christianity. In both of those efforts, the centrality of what is happening is on human effort. But as believers, we are called to recognize that God is sovereignly in control of all of human history, that all of the nations are in the palm of his hand, including our nation, and as such, there really isn't um, one party or another that is going to bring us to what God desires. Those parties weren't set up to do that in the first place. Our hope is in a different kingdom altogether. What does this mean for us? Actually, let me just say this last verse. Therefore, brothers, in uh, chapter 4, verse 1, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. The gospel is of a higher order than political parties. It, it's not a third way. It's just of a different order altogether. When Jesus sought his disciples, he sought Simon the zealot and Matthew the tax collector. Simon was on one extreme. He wanted to overthrow Rome, even using force if necessary and be violent. The tax collector Matthew would have gone and extorted people as he collected taxes from them. These two men and others within the realm of Jesus's ministry represented the right and the left politically, yet Jesus brought both into his fold. The gospel is of a higher order than both of the political bents. He says in his ministry, you should pay taxes on the one hand to Caesar, but he also says you should give to God what is God. He's limiting the order of politics and saying there's a higher order and that is the kingdom of God and that is that we are created in his image. He says in one instance you should beware of the leaven of the Herodians. The Herodians were a political party who had aligned themselves with Herod. We don't know a whole lot about them but certainly what it does mean is that we should be mindful of just putting our hope in an earthly realm of politics. Not that we disengage from politics but our hope is not there. In his encounter with Pilate, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's of a different order. I could call forth angels and they could fight for me, but my kingdom is not of this world. The gospel is of a higher order and should challenge us no matter where we are politically. Secondly, don't reduce politics to just this one issue, or it's just that one issue. The gospel is much more robust. The scripture is much ro more robust in what it teaches us about ethics than to say, well, it's really about this, or it's really about that. 
that's not to say that that can't be the reason why you vote one way or the other, but it's just to say that shouldn't be the measure by which we we judge other people and how they vote or didn't vote. As a community that's called to be campus and community transformed by Christ to renew the world, students, don't look at the older generations and say, well, why do they vote like this? And those in the older generation shouldn't say to the younger, why do you vote that way. We should not demonize one another and reduce politics to one issue or another. It is so much more complex than that. And in fact, if we can embrace that reality, I, it, would, it would bring down the tension and the polarization um, in our world. We have access to almost anyone in the world in social media. And it's important for us to recognize we need to filter who we are listening to and what we are watching and look at it through the lens of being called part of the heavenly kingdom, citizens of heaven. Because when we're on social media, the gradual, slight, imperceptible change in your behavior is the product. That is what is app there is, that's the whole game. Not to say that we can't use those platforms, but it's important to recognize what is happening and the good thing about that though, is it works in the other direction. If we imitate those whose image, whose identity is in the kingdom, that gradual, slight, imperceptible change works to help us to grow in that as well. There's a lot more I could say, but friends, I wanna encourage us that in this season, ultimately to not put our hope in earthly things to put, to put in our hope in the King of Kings. That yes, as citizens in a democratic uh, republic, we have a level of power in putting forth our vote, but we have more power as citizens of heaven, whose King is the King of Kings and whose sovereignty is over all of history. That if we commit to praying for our nation and praying for our elected officials, no matter which way the election goes, no matter how long it takes to figure it out, that we can have hope because ultimately our king, our true king is coming to renew things in according with his kingdom. If we are in a place where we think our party or our, our political favorite is the Messiah and the other alternative is the devil, we are messed up and mixed up all together. We are down on this lower earthly order. Jesus is calling us up to a higher order, to be marked by the gospel, to be transformed in our thinking, to have imi to imitate those whose way is following Jesus and to put our hope in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, there's a lot that I tried to say and said here, and there's so many different ways that it could, could be received. But ultimately, I pray that Holy Spirit that your word would resonate in the heart of your people. Lord, we pray for peace over our nation, but we also pray for peace in our own hearts. Whatever anxiety we feel, it may not even be about the election. It could be about just trying to make it through this moment in time. Lord, let our hearts await the King, the true King, the King of Kings, who's brought us forth into his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's transition and we're gonna take communion. And I think it's appropriate to think about communion because as we recognize all that is happening in our world, our hope is in our Lord Jesus. And he's inviting us, those of us who are his people, he's inviting us to participate in him. I want to encourage you in this in this moment. Maybe something got stirred up as we talked here, as I shared God's word. Maybe you recognize that there is something that you need to let go of. Perhaps you would say there's a way that you've judged people or you've put hope in the wrong place. You're going after comfort as your idol, whatever it is. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. But I do know that this is the place to come and receive grace from Jesus at his table. He talks about his body and his blood. And he says that it's the body broken for us and it's the blood poured out for us that ushers forth 
his covenant with us. I encourage you that if you're not a believer, this meal is not for you, but this is a time for you to reflect upon where ultimately is your hope in this season. We're going to have a time of, of the music will play and you can take communion in your own way. I'll pray and bless the elements and uh, release this over to Trevor. Lord, bless the elements and meet with us as we meet with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Pastor Brian. My question to you, TCBC, is how did God touch you today? What transformation began today as you heard the word and you've been worshiping with us today? Maybe God put a word on your heart. Maybe you have a question that you need to follow up on. Maybe someone whatever that is think about that and be be hearers and doers of the word let us be hearers and doers of the word there's a couple of ways that we can respond together right now in our service the first one of those is to remember that remember the connection card i'm getting a little feedback let me switch my mic here people Hey, I switched my microphone. Could someone give me a thumbs up? I see a thumbs up. Thanks, Barb Powell. All right. Let me backtrack a little bit. So what I was saying was, I know God put some things on my heart during the message today, during communion time today. What was that for you? What transformation is beginning in your heart, in your mind today? There are a number of ways that we can respond together during our service, the first one of those is our connection card. Remember I mentioned that before. There's a place on there where you can add some questions or some thoughts about the sermon. We would love for you to fill those out. Another way that you can respond is remember the prayer wall that I, that I mentioned before as well. Maybe you want prayer for something. Maybe you wanna pray for others. There is nothing more important than we can do right now in this 
season and this moment in time than to pray for one another. So put your prayer requests up there. I know I'm going to be checking later today. So I would love to pray for you. Um, I would love for you to share that. Another way that we can respond through the giving of our tithes and offerings to give to the church, to the important work that we in our community and around the world. You can see in the middle of the screen, ecbc.cc slash give. You can give online that way, or you can also mail a check to 806 West Michigan. You see the address there on your screen. And finally, another way that we can respond is through singing, through musical worship. So let's head back to Trevor and Kayla and let's sing our hearts out to the Lord. All right, join with us. We're gonna sing this song that's reminding us of, um, and saying to God that he is the one that is, is calling us into citizenship with his kingdom and he's the only righteous judge. He's, his kingdom is the unshakable thing um, in contrast with all of our human endeavors. So. Um, join with us wholeheartedly and sing this with us. Jealous for his own. 
Now let's receive our benediction. It comes from Romans chapter 15, verse five. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. Go in peace this week. Now join in singing the doxology. Peace.